Lord be with you. And also with you. It is good to worship the Lord. I invite you to stand with us as we hear God's call to worship. If you are following along in the bulletin and don't look at the screen, then you will be reciting Psalm 145 and our responsibility. But hear this call to worship. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, and the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and talk of them when you sit in your house. And when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Great is the Lord, and great is to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall command your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts on the glorious splendor of your majesty, and on your wondrous works I will meditate. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts be open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen.
as we approach the living God work, even as we are invited to approach him, we are conscious of our need to confess, and so let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like a lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against our holy laws. We have not known those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And apart from your Hear these words of assurance from John the Apostle speaking to the church on behalf of our Lord. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not only for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. And by this we know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Amen.
morning we have the privilege of uh, welcoming to our pulpit uh, Reverend Brian Bosher. He has, um, I know he's here because I spoke with him earlier, but he's here with his wife. And so after the service, uh, uh, we have an opportunity to greet he and his family. And for those of you that are visiting in our midst, we welcome you. We hope that you'll join us uh, afterward uh, at coffee. And uh, if you get there uh, early, you might get one of the special cookies. And uh, we look forward to meeting you. But as God has welcomed us in this place, if you'll stand and receive God's greeting, hear this good word. The Lord, ble- the Lord, grace, mercy, and peace be yours now and forever through Jesus Christ our Lord. And all God's people say, amen. It, the service is not over. I made a... Uh, <laughs> I did that once in Zealand and uh, got partway through it before I realized that uh, we needed to continue. Uh, but as God has greeted us in this place, let us pass the peace of Christ to one another. We, um, we make promises to our children when we stand at baptism and we stand before God and we uh, plan to raise them and teach them in the fear of the Lord. And as a congregation, we voice an affirmation that we will do that. And every week we send them down with a prayer to uh, continue that they may know the Lord. So join our hearts today as we pray for our children as they leave us this morning. O God, whose Son, Jesus, is the good shepherd of your children, grant that when we hear his voice, we may know him who calls us, each by name, and follow where he leads, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God forever and ever. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.
scripture reading today is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Praise the Lord for this wonderful day he's given to us. Amen. Thank you for the reading of the text for today. Uh, when uh, Pastor Tim reached out to me a few weeks ago, uh, he gave me a whole bunch of ideas and uh, said you're doing a series on um, life with God. Uh, a lot of spiritual disciplines, healthy ones that I hope we practice and learn to practice more. And it dawned on me that um, life with God when lived fully, involves life with each other. The two go hand in hand. He uh, also knows that I happen to be involved in a discipleship ministry called 222 Disciple, based on this text. Uh, for those of us who don't know each other at all, um, I was born and raised in a log cabin. No, I was uh, <laughs> southeast side of Grand Rapids, went to Christian school, uh, and uh, I was going to church twice on Sunday, nine months before I was even born. If you get to heaven for being Christian Reformed, okay, which you don't, but if you did, no one can match my credentials. I'm humbly proud of that, no. But like the Apostle Paul, I say, you know, my credentials are nothing. It's Christ. And we're going to take a brief look today at um, a somewhat young man named Timothy whose name means one who honors God. And he received some of the highest praise from perhaps the greatest disciple-making evangelist of all time, the Apostle Paul. Uh, life with God, life with each other. You can't do one without the other. And um, I'm hoping that as we listen to this short text and let the Spirit work in our minds and our hearts. And as we know that the Spirit is the one who activates us, right? We don't have the capacity on our own to choose Christ. The Spirit quickens us, makes us alive. And then we make all kinds of choices. 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. You then, my son. Whoa. Whoa. Son, child, why would Paul refer to Timothy? How many of you know what, what Paul, or what his, his original name was, Saul of Tarsus? Do you know what ethnic background he was? I like a little interaction. You can lip, don't say it out loud, but think it with me. He was Jewish. He gave, in fact, he gave a speech, if anybody gets to be heaven for being Jew, nobody beats him. He's, he's a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was on his way to being probably the number one candidate to become the religious ruler of the Israelites. Exceeded everyone else in his zeal for the law, Pharisee of Pharisees, Jewish. And when this group of people got energized by the belief that Jesus was and is the Messiah. And then they had the nerve to say that not only was he crucified for our sins as the ultimate fulfillment of all of the sacrifices prescribed in the Old Testament, they had the nerve to spread this rumor that he rose from the dead and was alive. And Saul of Tarsus, in his zeal, took all of his energy, all of his passion, his zeal for God, and turned it into righteous anger to try to shut down this movement that they called the way. It was a sect. It was an aberration of true faith, he thought, until that same Jesus, whom he despised, met him. Remember that story? 
blinded him with light. The most unlikely candidate that Jesus chose. Saul of Tarsus. And he changed him. Not instantly. Yes, the Spirit came upon him suddenly, but it took time for him to have his literally eyes opened because he was blinded. And then to go back to the Scriptures and find out that they actually did point to Jesus. And with the same anger, he turned that into love. And he submitted himself fully to Jesus. Now, he didn't grow on his own. We know that he was continually taught by other believers and by the Holy Spirit through the Scriptures. And we fast forward now to this letter to a young man named Timothy. The story goes, as you know, eventually the Holy Spirit would set Paul and Barnabas aside and say, I'm anointing the two of you to start traveling and go to the Jewish community scattered all around the then known world. And that's what he did. My wife Grace and I had a, a distinct pleasure of this past May uh, going on a trip to Greece before it turned into 105 degrees, which is what it is about right now. It's hot there. And we got to tour many of the places that the Apostle Paul actually traveled to. Saw the cities, Thessalonica, Philippi, and we saw Philippi, Corinth, Athens. Took a trip across the Aegean Sea and went over to Ephesus, Isle of Patmos. Beautiful trip. And I'd been to the Holy Land years ago, but I'd never been to these places where, where, where Paul was. And one of the many, many things that struck me about what Paul did is he didn't have this, this uh, witty travel itinerary all laid out for him like we did. Every meal was planned out, every hotel stay. All we had to do was get on the bus, get on the ship, follow our guide. Not him. And I didn't realize that Greece is a lot like Colorado, mountainous, lots of hills up and down. And Paul traveled all of that on foot, except when he obviously had to cross the sea. And he came to a town called Lystra, L-Y-S-T-R-A, Lystra. And he did what he always did, as his pattern was. He would go to a place, he would look for the Jewish synagogue because he knew he had a bit of a foothold there because those were people who, who had scrolls who had the scriptures, had synagogues, and they read the law of Moses. And he would preach in those synagogues and share with them how Jesus fulfilled all the laws of Moses and that Jesus was the one in whom they should believe. And when he came to Lystra, he met a family, Eunice, Lois, and Timothy, a grandma, a mom, and a boy, Now, I don't expect all of you to understand uh, where names come from, but the name Timothy. If you were listening carefully, there will be a quiz afterwards. If you want coffee, you have to pass my quiz. What did the name mean again? One who honors God. It's a combination of two Greek words. The the the-the comes from theos, the word for God. The Timae comes from the word to honor, one who honors God. What words, from what language is honor and God? It was from Greek. Hold it. We, we got a Jewish guy and a Greek man. We know from the scriptures that Timothy's mom, however, was Jewish. And so that makes daddy the Greek. So a mixed marriage, if you would. And in that mixed marriage, the Spirit of God worked and brought Timothy to faith. God, in his amazing providence, we call it. 
I don't know about you, but I, I've been blessed with living my life 69 and a half years. And as I look back, I, I can just see God's hand in the good and the not so good. The fun times, the painful times. Throughout all of your journey, wouldn't you say that you can look back? Some of you, I, I see a few other people with silver colored hair. Gray hair is a crown of splendor. It is attained by a righteous life. Be glad for the years, whether they've been six years or 60 or more. But when you look back, you see how God's hand directed. Paul did not have on his, his planner for that day, meet Timothy and take him under your wing. He did not. None of the things that he did, did he know. The Spirit of God knew. And he brought him to this one little household, and he saw Timothy with faith. Now, how many people do you think Paul met in his journeys? Half a dozen? Hundreds? Maybe thousands? Life with God involves not only meeting maybe lots of different people, it involves meeting critical people, certain people. And not just having a, an interaction, but forming a bond. Something about Timothy attracted Paul. And we know from other scriptures, we don't have time to look at all of them, but we know from these scriptures that what Paul did is he saw in Timothy not just who he was, but who he could become. And the Spirit said to him at some point, this is one of your disciples. Spend time with him. Pray with him. Listen to him. Open up the scriptures to him. Help him see whom God has called him to become. They met at Lystra. Paul formed such a bond with him that he decided to take him with him on his journeys after that. To give you a little glimpse into how he felt about Timothy, I turned to Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 and following. Just listen to this, folks. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon. Whoa. Now, I, I don't know if Pastor Tim was desperate because he didn't, like, give me a six-month notice. You know, I don't know if his plan A fell through. He said, oh, who do I? Oh, gosh. He happens to know my son David, who's also a pastor. The two of them have a, have a, a, a bit of a collegial relationship together. And thought, hey, does your dad still preach? And Tim knew me well enough to entrust me with this pulpit. God bless you, brother. Paul was so confident about Timothy that he couldn't go to Philippi, but he says, tell you what, I'm going to do this. I'm going to send Timothy to you that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. Then listen to these words of affirmation. There is... Um, he says, I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. For everyone looks out for his own interests, even in the ministry sometimes. They're selfish leaders. Sad. They don't look out for the interests of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. You see what's behind these few words? Paul didn't just go to the synagogues by himself. He brought Timothy with him. I'm sure there were times that Timothy, come on up, your turn to teach. 
Oh, but I've never done that before. Oh, you're doing it now, son. Come on. I know you have this timid spirit, but I, I pray that God would give you a spirit of love, power, and sound mind. Remember the calling that you received? I'm going to fan it into flame. You see, when you're doing life with God, I think he's always wanting us to be on the lookout for who else is to come with me? Who else uh, am I to, to pass on what I've learned, what I know? You then, my son. He says, be strong in the grace. Oh, don't you love that word? I love it because that's my wife's name, of course. So my grace is sufficient for you, <laughs> says God. It's all about grace, isn't it, folks? People of God. It is what God has done for me, for you. He fulfilled all righteousness and gave himself up for us. And he still does that. With the Father sent the Holy Spirit to us. It was so clear in our liturgical time together this morning that we sinners need a Savior. And, and, and not someone who just did it once and for all, which he did, but someone who continually greets us each day, reminds us that he loves us as we are and wants us to, to be, be bathed in his presence as we go through our days moment by moment. I have this theory, and I think it's based on truth, that most of us wake up a pagan, no matter how spiritually where we went to bed, we wake up and there's something inside of us or outside of us that says, oh, you, you know, you don't measure up, you got to do stuff today to earn favor, you got to prove yourself again, it's a new day, get out there, and it's like, no, you wake up loved, you wake up forgiven. You wake up filled with the knowledge that he is with you and wants to bless you. Timothy, you're going you're gonna to run into this thing that, that people in leadership often, they, they think that their, their, their grade is based on their performance. How big is your church? What kind of budget do you have? How many people come? How many people are members? How much work have you done? And when pastors gather together, it gets particularly difficult because then they want to compare notes. Well, my church, my church. Timothy, be strong in the grace. You are to reach out to people who think that they're trying to measure up. You've got to tell them again and again and again, it's not up to you. It was up to God through Jesus. Put your faith in Jesus. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll make your path straight. Okay, I, I, I got it, Paul. Be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. Now I'm all done, right? And he says, oh, no, 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 no. And what follows, what follows points out what I, I think and others, I think, would agree with me, perhaps you would too, that we've received the Great Commission. Who knows what the Great Commission is, right? Matthew 28, 16 to 20, our, one of our songs after this message is going to be about that. What is the Great Commission? At the heart of it is go and make disciples, right? Of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And I'm afraid that that great commission has become the great omission. Why do I dare say that? Because of 2 Timothy 2, verse 2. In these few words, we have this, this practice this kind of lost art, which I think is coming back to the church today. It says this. Here's what I want you to do. 
the things, Timothy, the things that you've heard from me. Okay, what have I heard from you? I, I've heard all about Jesus. I've heard about how to do basic things in ministry. I've, I've heard about how to, how to walk by faith. I've heard how to confess my sins when I fall short. I, I, every, all the things you've heard from me, my testimony of how I was living such a sinful life as a holy Pharisee. All the things you've heard from me. Oh, and where do you think I got my stuff from, Timothy? Did I make it up? No, I got it from the Scriptures and from Jesus Himself. The things that you've heard from me. Okay, I went to your Bible study. I filled in all my notes. I went to class, listened to your lectures. And now I got, a, I got this really cool notebook with all these nice notes in it. And these wonderful things that I can celebrate and just keep living my Christian life. There, I'm done, right? When's the next Bible study? No, the great omission stops there. Now, he's not opposed to good Bible studies, worship, Christian fellowship, all good stuff. But here is with a crux of what Jesus wants to happen. The things you have heard from me and trust, give away. Not just to any old person. Yeah, I want you to preach to the crowds, but here's what I want you to do. Entrust to reliable people. That isn't everybody. And where do you think Paul got that idea from? I remind you of Jesus' style. Preach to the crowds. Feed the crowds. But after spending a night in prayer with the Father, he came out of it and he called to himself just a handful of disciples. Ended up with 12. <laughs> Unlikely selection of gentlemen. Jesus would establish this pattern. The things you have heard from me entrust to reliable people. So Timothy, be on the lookout let the Spirit guide you. Look for people who have qualities that will tell you that they would be worth investing in. To summarize what those qualities are, I've, I've used the little acrostic uh, for fat. You look for fat people. You say, what? Don't go to Weight Watchers? What? what? Faithful. People that you count on, when they say, I'll be there, they're there. When you give them something to do, they do it. They're faithful. They're not just a flash in the pan, steady. Secondly, they are available. Oh, I'd love to do that. Oh, but I'm so busy. And I made this appointment, but something came up. Sorry, I can't be there. Must be present to win. Faithful. Available, teachable, willing to learn. Personally, since I retired, got redeployed in 2019 when I uh, retired from full-time ministry at the Hillcrest CRC in Hudsonville, I got involved in this 222 ministry, and uh, one of the people that I was, was, had the privilege of discipling, his name is Paul. I've nicknamed him the Apostle Paul because he has been a missionary in the Ukraine. He planted churches in the Amazon. The man has this incredible uh, uh, resume of ministry, including he's an author of a number of books. And then I was invited to disciple him. I'm like, I don't know. I nicknamed him the Apostle Paul. But he was fat. And out of that little relationship, when he and I started meeting one-on-one, -on -one, a lot of it was online because he was not living in Michigan here and going to Brazil still every now and then to do ministry. He is now heading up a Portuguese effort in the country of Brazil, taking dozens and dozens of people that he's connected to, and he's doing what Paul told Timothy, entrust to reliable men. 
reliable people. And that's where it ends, right? Timothy's all done. He's, he's taken what he's heard from Paul, from Jesus. He's not going to just keep it to himself. He's going to get involved in intentional discipling relationships with a few reliable people. All done, right? You're staring at me like, are you done yet? What did the text say? Who will also teach others? If you look at it, there's actually five people in this chain of discipleship. There's Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith, the greatest disciple maker of all, and then there's Paul. He reached Paul. Paul didn't keep it to himself. He reached many, many people with the gospel, planted many churches, but his most lasting impact were when he discipled a few key people. Timothy, there he is. Good thing he didn't stop with Timothy. Timothy, this Jewish-Gentile combo, two reliable people. So we don't know their names, but Timothy did that. One of the highest compliments that Paul would pay Timothy later in his ministry was to say, I've got this church. It's in a major, major, major city of influence. There's a God named Artemis that the whole world is worshiping. The economy is all built around this idolatrous female figure. Demons thrive in this city. It's a hard, hard place to preach the gospel. I'm going to send you there, Timothy. You're my guy. Ephesus. Jesus, Paul, Timothy, reliable people. And then it just says others. And I don't know if you realize, are, are there any thoroughbred Jews here this morning? How about Gentiles? Any, any Gentiles? Put your hand up high if you're a Gentile. It means you're not a Jew. Did you know that if it weren't for this great commission, we wouldn't be here today. If somebody stopped this chain of life, it would all be over. And the things you've heard from me and trust to reliable people who will in turn pass them on to others. A lot of you are discipling, you just don't know it, haven't given it that label. If you are given children, those are your first disciples. You've been given a spouse, that's a partner in discipleship. But who else? I didn't know very many, I hardly know any of you before I came here. I told Grace, I said, I don't think I know anybody there, but I did see a couple people. They looked older, though. <laughs> and then this wonderful smiling face as I was kind of getting ready. I thought I'd preach down there, and I found out from this guy. He says, no, you need to come up here. Smiling guy with jeans on, pleasant spirit. You know what I'm talking about? What's his first name? Jay. He was Reverend Jay, however you pronounce that last name. <laughs> I didn't notice Jay, I didn't even try. Smiling. What a spirit this man has. Ah, I see you got it from your wife. <laughs> <laughs> and then he warmly greeted me. I felt, wow, I, I like being here. And then we walked over to the uh, council room, whatever, and some more wonderful people there. And then Lydia walked in the room. And he said, y'all. I thought, okay, what's, the, what's going on here? And I don't know Jay's whole story, but I know that this is a man who has made disciples. And he talked about Lydia when she was what? Well, that would be much lower he had a part in her faith, watching her grow. Brother, you have no idea how many lives you've touched. 
And I'm sure I don't know the names, but there's probably a few people who would say, why are you where you are spiritually? You played a big part in that. And I'm sure if we had a chance to listen to everybody, so that, and, and if, I, if, if, if we had a chance to ask other people, would anybody name you as somebody, as a person of godly influence? I'm sure there would be some. But there's a movement afoot. I get to be a part of it. Your pastor knows all about it. He's involved with it. And I'm not going to give a used car salesman pitch for it. But I just want to invite you to keep the chain going. Don't be content to just get yourself there or even to just get someone else to come with you because that is not enough. What is the saying? That grandchildren are God's reward for not selling your own? <laughs> or maybe that was just our family. I don't know. Do you have any spiritual grandchildren? Somebody that you have reached so well that they reach someone else. Let that be a part of our life with God. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank and praise you for a faith that is worth passing on. For a Jesus who is so, so utterly worthy of praise and adoration and following that we cannot keep quiet about him. That we want more people to know him, to love him, and to obey him. And thank you that it is never to end with us. There's always someone else. Someone else in this wonderful link of discipleship that one generation will tell to the next, not in massive numbers, but one-to-one. -one. May there be more spiritual mothers and daughters, and fathers and sons, who will multiply disciples until the whole earth has heard and all of those that you have ordained to salvation will come to you fully. We pray this humbly and expectantly in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, and all God's people said,
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning with hearts full of gratitude and praise. You have created us, sustained us, and called us to be your disciples. We thank you for the gift of faith and for those who have guided and nurtured us along our spiritual journey. As we reflect on the impact others have had on our lives, we are reminded of our responsibility to pass on the faith to others. Help us to be faithful in this calling, multiplying our faith just as you have commanded from the very beginning. Lord, we also lift up our church family to you, especially those who are in need of your healing and comfort. We pray for the family of Joyce Dark as they mourn her passing. We ask for swift healing for Dick Good as he recovers from surgery and strength for Shirley as she cares for him. We pray for Ray Kuiper as he undergoes rehabilitation and for Mary North as she navigates her diagnosis and treatment options for thyroid cancer. We lift up Debbie Brock as she recovers from her recent hip replacement surgery. Surround each of these dear ones with your peace, strength, and healing presence. We also bring before you the people of Cuba, whom our youth recently visited. We pray for the ministries and churches there, asking that you bless their efforts and provide for their needs. May the seeds of faith planted during our trip grow and bear much fruit, and may the people of Cuba experience your love and grace in powerful ways. As we reflect on the celebrations of the Coast Guard last week, we thank you for the men and women who serve our country with dedication and courage. Bless them and their families and grant them protection as they carry out their duties. We also pray for our nation as a whole, asking for your guidance and wisdom for our leaders and for unity and peace among our people. We thank you for the message shared by Reverend Bosher today. May your spirit continue to work through the words we have heard, helping us understand what it means to be your disciples and inspiring us to live out our faith daily. Lord, we trust in your unfailing love and grace. May our worship today honor you, and may we leave this place inspired and equipped to share your love with the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all. Amen.